All right, my name is Sarah and I'm the Director of Events and Product Marketing at VHA. So welcome to our first webinar. It's a collaboration series with MinPets. Um, we're hosting a monthly, uh, monthly series of nine sessions. Future topics will center around client communication, team management, and compassion resilience. So be sure to check our website for upcoming event registrations. Um, for this event, if you have any questions as we go, go along, please use the chat function at the bottom. Um, so our speakers today are Dr. Rebecca McComas and Christy Lehman. Um, Dr. McComas is the owner of Min Pets, one of our local Twin Cities home euthanasia practices. She's joining us today to share some of what she has learned over the last 10 years about providing excellent end-of-life care and will be giving us some tips on how to hopefully come to enjoy helping clients when a pet reaches the end of life. Christy Lehman is the Vice President of Min Pets and is a licensed social worker. She has been doing veterinary social work for eight years and has been with Min Pets for seven years. She's excited to be here to share her knowledge about supporting clients through the euthanasia experience and how to take care of your own well-being through the process as well. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everybody, and welcome. We are very glad that you were able to join us today. Um, I appreciate that introduction, Sarah, and we will sort of um, describe a little bit more about us and about Minnesota Pets in just a moment. But this topic, knowing when it's time and helping clients who aren't ready when the pet is, is just, it's a situation that veterinary teams are facing quite frequently. And I'm sure that you have seen it at your practice as well. It is one of those aspects of our type of work that really creates stress, or it can create quite a bit of stress. So this is a time of too much stress anyway with everything else that is going on right now. So I think it is a good time for us to talk about it. It's an important topic and let's share some tools with you that can help these situations go well. That's our goal for today. Let's see if I can get my slides to go. There we go. So what is Minnesota Pets? Who are we? Uh, Minnesota Pets is a practice here that's local in town. We get referrals from many of your practices and we so greatly appreciate that. Um, your trust and support means a great deal to us and of course means a great deal to your client when you make that referral. Um, we love to be an extension of that wonderful care that you already provide to your clients. And in case you just don't know much about us or who we are, we are 100% mobile. We have 16 veterinarians right now that travel around the Twin Cities to provide in-home euthanasia mainly, and we do just a little bit of quality of life assessment in the home as well. We do provide cremation services for all of our clients if they need it and want it, and if any of your clients happen to have a pet that deceases at home on its own, we can help with cremation that way as well. So Christy and I, we have been doing this for lots of years and we have encountered a lot of situations related to end of life care, as you can imagine. So we're just here to share some of that experience with you today. And here's the topics that we are going to cover. The moral stress of end of life decisions. Understanding the discrepancy between the pet's needs and the client's needs. Sometimes there is a discrepancy there. How to successfully facilitate an end of life discussion with clients how to support and communicate with clients who aren't ready when you and everyone on your team knows that euthanasia might be a very appropriate choice. And then finally, how to debrief and care for your team during morally stressful situations. All of these are very important aspects. Moral stress often occurs in clinic settings in the context of end-of-life care decisions. I feel like it needs to be said, but I also feel like it's fairly obvious. For any of us who are working in this field, we know this to be true. So let's dive in and dig a little deeper to see what this moral stress is, how it happens, and why it happens. And Christy, can you take us a little further into this topic? Yes, so for the last few years, and really, I mean, since I entered the field of veterinary social work, there's been a lot of discussion about compassion fatigue and burnout in veterinary medicine, and I think Probably everyone here knows that um, just either as something that you've heard or something that you've felt yourself or um, that you've witnessed in your coworker. So I think that piece is pretty well, you know, accepted. That makes sense to us. It's a stressful field. Up until sort of recently, it was unknown what exactly the causes of that compassion fatigue and risk for burnout is. 
And the study came out actually in 2018 that dug more deeply into that. And they found that one of the highest or greatest causes of that compassion fatigue was this idea of moral distress and these moral stressors that come up quite often um, in the clinic settings. So when we say moral stress, it means that you are aware of what um, ethical principles are at stake, but external factors prevent you from doing the thing that you feel is the right thing to do. It's sort of this can't win situation. So as vet teams, you have obligations to pets, the owners, your teammates, society, the clinic and business, uh, just so many external factors that affect your decision making and what you can do for clients and pets. And often those are in conflict with each other. And that moral stress is really what happens when those things are in conflict with each other. And that research really shows that that is one of the causes of compassion fatigue. And that's sort of new information. Before that study, we probably knew that on a gut level because we've all felt it, but we just hadn't, we didn't have the data to support that that ongoing moral stress really contributes to that compassion fatigue. So this study that came out in 2018 had some really interest, interesting statistics, and I just want to share these with you, especially because you might be thinking as you're hearing this, you know, yes, that's happened, and yes, I can think of specific times when I felt this way, and putting a name to it, I think, is very important, and I wanted to share these statistics to show you just how common it is so that you know that you are not alone in noticing this and feeling this way. Uh, so the study showed that 32% of veterinarians said that they often have conflicts with clients about how to proceed with care, and 53% said sometimes. So really, those two statistics together mean that quite often, if not most of the time, there is some level of conflict between what you would like to do to proceed and what the client would like. 45% um, of the team members said they're sometimes asked to do something that feels wrong. And you might be thinking that number might even feel higher, and I don't disagree with that. And I think that's really unique. I don't think many people are doing work in, in fields where that is so common. And so that's really unique to veterinary medicine in a lot of ways. 63% of respondents said that they sometimes or often can't do what they feel is right. And that's that can't win situation that we mentioned. 78% said that that causes moderate or severe distress. And I would probably argue that the remaining people who said that it don't just haven't had that happen yet and probably will. I mean, I just think there are very few situations where having to do something that you don't feel is right wouldn't cause distress. And so that's very uh, normal and common. Um, many people, 29%, said that they sometimes or often get inappropriate euthanasia requests. And you can probably think of situations right now um, where that's happened in your team and clinic as well. And many of them, most of them said that it causes them severe or moderate distress. And then more than 70%, and I think this one is almost the most important, more than 70% of respondents in the study said that they received no instruction in either conflict resolution or self-care. And so mm -hmm. all of these statistics together paint a really clear picture of what we're sort of struggling with on veterinary teams. And so even though we're talking about it specifically in the context of helping clients with end of life care, I wanted to give you this background just as a starting point to, to learn beyond today's talk, um, but especially to apply what we're talking about today to your own team and your own work. So I wanted to pull out this quote from the study. Um, the, lead, the lead author says, for years my colleagues and I suffered mostly in silence with the stress of our work. Our study confirmed what I suspected, namely that ethical conflict causes a lot of stress and specifically moral distress in veterinary practice. My colleagues often don't have the tools to deal with it. And I think you probably feel like this confirms many of the things that you've felt too. And I think these things come up very often in end of life care, especially. And we hopefully will share some tips. These are things that our teams deal with very often at Minnesota Pets too. We get calls every day um, for owners who are trying to schedule end of life care or talk to us about their options. And it is very, very common that, you know, what we would do with our own pets is different than what, you know, that client is able to do in the moment. And so we have kind of combined the, you know, the research that we're looking at here and also what we've done. And so we'll be sharing that with you today too. So the common situations as it relates to end of life care would be um, if the euthanasia is appropriate, but the client won't euthanize. And likewise, if the euthanasia is not appropriate, but the 
client requests euthanasia. And so these are the two sides of the coin that you probably have experienced in clinics. This is what you know we encounter at Minnesota Pets too. So in these situations, you're really put into a can't win situation and that can cause stress, compassion, fatigue, anxiety, sadness, guilt, many emotions and none of them feel good. And so this is a really tough situation to be in. Um, and we mentioned this earlier, but 69% of the veterinarians in the study said that they felt moderate to severe distress about not being able to give animals what they thought was the right care. Because we have, you know, we are the veterinary team and our patients are the, are the pets, but we have a pesky third party and that's the client. And I know for a lot of people in clinics that, that third party, that client is really, you know, sometimes it feels like a wrench in the care that you want to provide. And I, I want to help you know, change and reframe that a little bit and so that you can kind of align with the client. And we'll talk about those communication skills um, today too. But I know that that triangle of care, you, the pet, and the client, that can cause a lot of complexity and moral distress. And so these things that you've probably felt related to end-of-life care, it's recorded in the research and it makes a lot of sense and you're, you're definitely not alone in that. So we mentioned the pet owner, the client, and your care. We also have, um, you know, the clinic or, you know, your company or businesses protocols. There are other members of the team. There are a lot of those external factors, and sometimes they are all in conflict with each other, or even two of them are in conflict with each other, and that makes what, what could seem like a simple discussion or a simple decision much, much more complex. So at Minnesota Pets, we have sort of, we call it a proven process for navigating these um, end of life decisions. And most of what we're looking at here on the screen is actually what our support team um, kind of navigates with the client before the visit. Once our doctors arrive to the home, we're sort of, they're in a situation where they are sort of on the same page with the client. They have all of the information. The client is obviously consenting to having them there. They want to help their pet with euthanasia. And so our support team often um, fields these more difficult and complex uh, conversations. So we focus on having early conversations with clients. We focus on holistic quality of life considerations, which um, Rebecca will talk about in a moment. And then we focus on unconditional compassion, which I know is much easier said than done, but I think it's important. Um, we emphasize this with our team a lot. Our clients are going through many difficult things when they call us. Sometimes it's much more than even what they're calling us about with their pet. And especially this year, there's a lot going on um, for everyone in their lives. And so we try to really come from a place of empathy and unconditionally treat them with compassion, even when it's most difficult and probably especially when it's most difficult. Um, we also believe that clients are the best decision makers regarding end of life care for their pet. That is um, difficult and probably controversial, but we do feel that clients know their pet best and they are really in the best position to know when their pet is suffering. Of course, there are situations where maybe that client isn't as well informed or educated on the condition or the options that they have. Um, but at the end of the day, we, we know that they are the ones that have to live with their decision. And so we wanna do our best to support them to come to a conclusion that they can live with. We don't have to necessarily live with it in the way that they do. So we feel it's important to align with them and get them to a place that they are at peace with. And then we feel it's our responsibility to ensure that clients can be fully informed and supported in their decision. And we get into that a lot in this talk, but those are all of the things that, that sort of shape how we approach these decisions. So early on, I realized taking phone calls for Minnesota Pets um, that there's something that we all need to be very careful about, especially when you're navigating these kind of conversations. And that is that you may be sending some subtle cues that you're not even realizing around making the decision for them or implying what their decision should be, or even passing judgment if the decision isn't completely in alignment with what you would have probably chosen if it had been for your own pet. These are some of the sorts of words that we hear on the phone sometimes when people call us. We find it a bit distressing, so we wanted to share that. I'm calling you today because my clinic won't euthanize my pet. We hear that sometimes. It's not super common, but it's something for you all to be aware of as you're having these conversations. It can be so tough, I think, when you're on a veterinary team to reach the point in a case where you make a decision that there just aren't any more treatments available. 
there are no more treatment options that haven't already been explored. Inevitably, I think it's times like that that make us feel like failures as uh, veterinary teams, that somehow we have let them down. And we don't, we sort of have this innate human desire to not give up hope. None of us ever want to make our client give up hope about what may happen with their pet. Um, but the truth is that life will always come to an end. And that death is an end of the life, but not a failure of the team or of the client. I think it is probably better to come to a point of acceptance about this, that every pet's life will come to an end, no matter how good you are at your job or no matter how far that client is willing to go with treatment. Death could be planned for, or death can come as a surprise. And when to stop treatment is a very personal decision for every client. So at, on our end, we believe that making a plan for the timing of the pet's death is preferable because then the owner gets to choose when and how and where that may take place. Um, rather than making it something that is a surprise. And I think probably all of us have had conversations with clients or phone calls the morning after the pet ended up going to the emergency clinic or just passing at home in a way that maybe wasn't as peaceful as what the client might have hoped. And so planning, even if it's a day or two earlier, then the absolute last moment is probably better. Um, and the decisions are just never as simple as we would wish. If it was just like, if this thing happens, we always know it's the right time for euthanasia. That just isn't how life decided to make it for us. There are a lot of things that factor into the best timing for euthanasia. And to keep it simple on our end, we've kind of bundled these things into three different categories, three different main areas. So when you are helping a client work through decisions, I think it's very helpful to acknowledge to them that there are these three categories to pay attention to, and that some of the factors for their family or for their situation might outweigh some of the other factors. And honestly, that is a very independent in each individual situation. So you can, as you're having these conversations with people, tailor your questions to these three categories to try to help the client start to elicit some understanding about how that factors into the timing. So it's suffering and pain is the first category, quality of life is the second category, and then being able to meet the client or meet the pet's needs for care is the third category. And let's just take these each one at a time. We'll start with suffering and pain. I want you for just a moment before I share my list with you is just to think back. You, this is your bread and butter. You talk about this very often. What are some of the subtle signs of pain and suffering that you ask your clients to watch for? And this is not the sort of, um, live interactive conversation that we could have if we were in person. The corona has prevented all that for us for right now. But if you wanted to, you're welcome to throw things up in the chat window too. And just what are some of the things that you want your clients to watch for as far as subtle signs of pain? I'm going to share my list with you too, but um, feel free to add things that I didn't think of and please do. So some behavioral cues that we ask people to watch for would be hiding behaviors, Pets that are avoiding human interaction when that's unusual for them. We've all heard of the cats and maybe even dogs that try to avoid human interaction, but this is the ones that don't typically do that. Inappropriate elimination where that hasn't been a part of their history in the past. If the pet is infrequently grooming themselves, especially for a cat or a dog who has a tucked tail, those are behavioral cues that to a client may appear very subtle. Um, other signs to watch for would be shaking, panting, trembling, diminished appetite. If they are repeatedly licking a certain area of their body, that can be very telling. If they're avoiding movement, if they're just spending more time resting, but are at the flip side having difficulty sleeping. If they're vocalizing, which can be rare. I mean, I always think if it gets to the point of vocalizing, we've missed a lot of the earlier subtle cues that may have already been there. And glazed eyes are like, way down the path into very severe, severe signs. So that's what we encourage our clients to look for. And honestly, this education that you're providing for them about what is normal versus abnormal behavior is so helpful because if you can help them to notice these behaviors, then they will feel more confident with their decision. 
encourage them to not wait for extreme signs like vocalization or not moving at all. Those are really like end stage signs. And I would also like to encourage you, even though Zoetis doesn't um, sponsor this talk or anything, but they have some really good online tools, um, especially regarding osteoarthritis folks for dogs and cats to help clients start to pay attention to those kind of signs, which is often what's going on with pain and suffering. So use those as well as the quality of life scoring tools. You may be familiar with those as well. And I know Christy, I think you're gonna mention a few of those in a couple minutes too. So helping them watch for subtle signs can be really helpful. Mental suffering is a form of suffering. Um, I just really wanted to make a special note about this because I think it can be overlooked sometimes. These are pets that are physically speaking healthy, but are mentally suffering and not enjoying a quality of life that is a good quality of life. In Minnesota Pets, we get calls about this all the time. And it is uh, sometimes the most difficult decisions for pet owners to make. It's easier to make a decision about end stage cancer certainly than it is about pets who have extreme anxiety and things that are just preventing them from um, being able to adapt to their environment. And these are often, as I'm sure you've experienced too, some of the most amazing clients have done things over many years to try to adapt their home environment in a way that would make that pet enjoy a good quality of life. And it at some point is not always successful. I do believe that these clients need and deserve our support probably more than, more than ever, I would say. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about quality of life. Quality of life is considering the big picture, the more holistic view, the pet's general sense of well-being. Here are some signs of diminished quality of life. If they are no longer engaging in the play behaviors that they would have done perhaps years ago, if they don't enjoy the things that they used to, if they love their dog that always loved going in the car, but they don't want to go in the car anymore, that's something that clients can watch for. Consistent weight loss is absolutely related to quality of life. Either they're not taking in the same number of calories or their body is in a cachectic state and it's losing um, weight. If the pet is vocalizing or this kind of odd attention seeking behavior that often doesn't show up until this stage of life where your client describes to you that they always seem to be asking me for something, but I can't figure out what that is. I can't give them something that seems to satisfy that need. If those are words that you're hearing, that absolutely points to quality of life issues. Another thing I really want you to consider is if the pet is increasingly isolated. And I know that you can imagine dogs and cats for which isolation contributes significantly to mental suffering because these are the pets that are really bonded to their owners and want to be with them most, if not all, of the day. They may be isolated because of bad elimination behaviors. Maybe their mobility is such that they cannot go up and down the stairs to be with the family. Or if they have behavioral changes, which mean that the pet owner has had to isolate them in an area by themselves. So those are really, really concerning issues. And then kind of um, something that I think we often refer to with clients is when their bad days are beginning to outnumber the good days. And clients can track that just so easy in a little notebook. It doesn't have to be a big complicated process at all. Just something that they can jot down each day. Was this a good day or not a good day? They can even just use a smiley face or a frowny face to indicate how that day had gone for them. Really encourage people to do that. And the client's own physical, financial, and emotional resources. This is resources that pertain specifically to the client. All of these things impact their ability to provide care for that pet that's getting close to the end of life. Clients can sometimes wish to do more care, but their finances are limiting that. Sometimes they have a hundred pound dog and they simply cannot lift that dog up and down the stairs on their patio to be able to eliminate outdoors. There's physical limitations for people. Um, and certainly it is uh, ways on their emotional resources as well, particularly if they don't have great support uh, in their life or in their household. So these are the categories that we encourage people to think about and the things that we hear about the most often. Sometimes those pets needs exceed their resources. These are some of the common reasons that people do consider euthanasia, but they feel a huge amount of guilt about this sometimes because it feels like they're failing. If their obligations and responsibilities at work 
conflict with their ability to care for their pet. Now the fact that people are working from home more, maybe this is actually going down a little bit, but when people had to go into the office for eight or 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, that really reduces their ability to provide medications on a two, three, four times a day basis that they sometimes need to. Every single day you hear from people where the financial burden of veterinary care is getting to be overwhelming for them and unrealistic to continue. And then of course, these severe elimination of behavioral changes. And those are the ones that diminish quality of life enough that it's for the family's quality of life. You might have children at home that are crawling around on the carpet where the pet is eliminating. And that becomes a situation that it really um, becomes an untenable situation to keep that pet at home. I wanna share with you um, just an image of the brochures that we have brought to many clinics in the Twin Cities. If you don't already have them, give us a call. We would love to provide them for you. Um, we also on our website at minnesotapets.com or mnpets.com, we have a very detailed version of the same information as all the things that we just talked about. It's those three categories in more detail. And you can reach out to us when you need replacements. We're happy to provide those for you uh, all the time. Please be the first person to bring up euthanasia with your client. You can know they are already thinking about it and they will be appreciative if you at least say something about it because it opens up the conversation that this is the right time to be thinking about it. And here's some words that you could use. If you decide to schedule a euthanasia visit for Buddy today, I would support your decision. These kind of words are very powerful because implicit in them is permission. And sometimes clients are waiting for permission from you because you're a professional and you know more than they do about pets medical care. It's also an acknowledgement that the timing for euthanasia feels realistic and acceptable to you given your experience as a professional. So the big question is, how do you know when it is time? And I will share with you some cringy words that I do not want to hear, I don't like to hear. Sometimes, Early in my career, when I didn't know what I was doing very much, I would say things like, oh, you're just going to know. Somehow your pet will tell you. And I think those words keep this process a little too mysterious. Um, it leaves the client waiting for some big sign that they're supposed to recognize. Um, and I think that's not very fair. Um, many of our clients have little to no experience at all with the end of life um, process for a pet. And... They are not just magically bestowed with the knowledge of this. So it is better to serve your clients with some practical knowledge of very concrete things that they can watch for. Bring it out of the mysterious and the mystical down into the real. And that is especially helpful for those clients who maybe never been through this before. So what I really like to tell people is start using the imagery with your client if you don't already that there is a window of time versus one aiming at sort of one right moment. Clients want and wait for this sign, but rarely is there a moment or a single moment when euthanasia suddenly becomes the right choice. That isn't how it often happens. We hear clients a lot of times who are very fearful about making a decision too soon. They're afraid of premature decisions, but instead they should probably be focused on avoiding a late decision. In our work, we have conversations with thousands of clients at the time of death, in those few moments before and after their pet passes away with us. And they share stories over and over and over that they waited too long. In my entire career at Minnesota Pets in 10 years, I have not heard one story from a client where they said they felt regretful because they decided too soon. I have never heard that. And we hear thousands on the other side. So. Because this is so important, Christy, and the fact that um, making a decision too late tends to be more traumatic, less planful, more trips to the emergency room that feel very um, awful to the clients who have to go through that. Even though the emergency clinic is such wonderful people, it's just not the type of experience that people have been hoping for. So I would love if you can take us through a couple of slides to talk about the tools for communication. Yeah, and a lot of the upcoming, like what we talk about with this communication is from the assumption that some of these conversations are very difficult and some of them are coming from a place where we might not be starting from the same page as the client. I think we 
all have some really wonderful conversations with clients that go very smoothly and, you know, we have a good relationship and rapport. And, and so I think you all are doing wonderful with those conversations. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on the conversations that are, are tougher to have with clients. Um, and I just want to kind of explicitly state that it is important to maintain that sub supportive communication with clients, even if they're making a decision that doesn't fit with your recommendations or personal feelings. Again, that's easier said than done. I know there are some very frustrating situations that just really touch us on a deep level and are sometimes hard to shake. But I think the reason it's important, um, other than just providing support to a person who's going through a difficult thing. But even more than that, you know, we want what is best for that pet. And it's sometimes a journey to get there. And if we um, have these conversations with clients that are difficult, they're not always going to be successful. We will, of course, have clients that choose something different than we hope they choose. But if we lose that supportive open line of communication, our chances of meeting them where they are and helping them understand go down and down and down. So we want to maintain that supportive communication, at least for the sake of the pet, so that we can communicate clearly with the client. So with those productive supportive conversations, because you might be thinking, okay, well, how do I know if I'm communicating supportively? How do I make a conversation supportive? So a few things that you can do to just lay that groundwork. Um, first, right away, as soon as possible, align yourself with the client by identifying a common goal. And usually it's as simple as, I know we both want, you know, what's best for Buddy, or we want him to, you know, avoid as much pain as possible. We want him to be able to say goodbye at home. Whatever you and the client both want, because most of the time you will have an aligned goal um, to state that and just name it for them. It helps align you with them. Acknowledge their pain. This feels very um, kind of basic and foundational, but I think it's easy to forget this when we're communicating with clients, but just to explicitly acknowledge their pain and to say something like, I know that what you're going through is so difficult. I know there are so many options. I know this is overwhelming. Saying those things really conveys empathy um, on a different level. And I know, you know, we often hope that clients just know we empathize with them or just know that we support them. But I think a lot of times they need to hear us say those words. And, you know, with our team on the phone, we don't ever have face-to-face -face conversations with clients. So we have to train ourselves to explicitly state that empathy and to say it out loud and not just rely on our body language or the fact that we're helping and to really say it to them, that we support them, we understand what they're going through. Um, and like Rebecca mentioned, really try to take the lead. Um, we, there's actually been studies for human hospice teams that have shown that families of hospice patients have named that kind of ability of the hospice team to take the lead, describe what's happening, tell them what's coming next, give them their options, those very direct ways of explaining what's happening. That is usually the most helpful thing that those families um, express and report on. And so I think the same is probably true for hospice situations for pets. Um, so it can be difficult and it takes bravery and um, it takes practice, definitely, because these are hard things to bring up. Um, but it is important for us to be the ones to guide clients through that and then meet the client where they are. So this is really important um, because we don't always, you know, we can kind of assume what clients are thinking, um, but that can lead us down the wrong path and we don't always assume correctly. And so it is really important to just assess, like, where are they? And some ways that I like to do that are to say, you know, what's going through your mind right now when we talk about this or what's going through your mind right now when we um, look at Buddy and how he's walking here today? Or, you know, what worries do you have right now? And just those open-ended kind of vague questions, even more than just, you know, what questions do you have for me? But very specifically, like, what are you thinking? Or what, you know, after I talk about Buddy's condition worries you? And asking those questions gives them a chance to explain where they're at. They may say something about, you know, wondering if it's time to consider euthanasia. They may have a totally different worry, but that at least gives you a place to start and meet them where they are and kind of take the conversation from there. So for the clients who aren't quite ready, but it's clear to us that the pet likely is ready, there are a few things, and I have a slide on each of these things, but we're going to talk about um, practicing collaborative communication, empathizing with clients, um, understanding the why not and not just the why, which I'll talk a little bit more about, um, discussing and explaining all options, and then providing resources to clients. 
So when we say collaborative communication, um, we mean like we language. It means aligning with the client and approaching the situation as like a problem that you're solving together. So reminding the client that they don't need to make the decision alone, um, reminding them that you're there with them, that that's why you're there to help them make these decisions and kind of sharing the load of the decision. We know that ultimately it's the client's decision, but if they feel like it's not totally up to them, like there's someone else kind of helping them make this decision, it can feel so much better to them. And it takes away some of that fear that they'll make the wrong decision. And, you know, even reminding them, you know, if that's a fear of theirs and if they say that, even reminding them, I won't let you make the wrong decision. I will tell you, you know, and just being very direct, I think is helpful. So saying things like, I'm here to help with this. Um, you don't have to make this decision alone we can take a look at Buddy, we can talk through the options. Using we as much as possible can be very helpful for clients. And it just reminds them that they aren't in this alone and that they're not making this impossible decision that they have no training in um, by themselves. That's what you're there for. And then empathizing. So um, when you make these recommendations for clients, which are sometimes hard for them to hear, they're most effective when they're paired with really genuine empathy and clients can notice if, if empathy is not genuine. So it's really important to, you know, say with your words and also with your body language and all of your other behavior, really try to understand what they're thinking or feeling and then reflect it back to them. So if you're explaining a difficult diagnosis and you just kind of see that client, you know, glaze over a little bit, it's okay to stop and say, this is so overwhelming. I can tell this is a lot to take in. Let's, you know, let's go back and talk about this or what questions do you have for me before I move on? Or is there anything that I can do to describe this differently? I know it's, it's complex or it's um, probably new for you um, to hear these words, just kind of stopping and, and uh, clarifying and making sure that they understand. So that would just be one example. Or if they are feeling upset to say, I know this is really frustrating. I know this is not what we wish. So just naming those feelings out loud back to the client. So example, you must be feeling very overwhelmed by this news. I can understand how scary this is. It's very simple to do that. And I think it's one of the things that we forget often, especially when we're busy, especially when we're losing patience. And so that is a habit to develop. I would say it's probably the most important habit to develop. So this one um, is probably, it's a little different. So we often on our phone calls, we ask a lot of questions about, you know, what are you seeing in your pet? What caused you to give us a call? And so many people call us even not being quite ready to schedule euthanasia or they, you know, cancel and reschedule. And so they're struggling in that way. And one of the things I like to stop and ask them is more of a why not type of question. So if I can better understand what's preventing them from scheduling euthanasia or what's preventing them from kind of seeing what I'm seeing maybe, it helps me meet them where they are and kind of work through that a little bit better. So for example, I would say something like, you've described some important things you've noticed about Buddy's quality of life. Can you tell me what you're seeing that makes you think it's not quite time to consider euthanasia? Or sometimes I'll ask them if they've ever had to make this decision before and what it was like. So many times clients will say, well, I did this 10 years ago and it was awful or, you know, some traumatic experience that they had back when we did euthanasias differently. Um, and some of my clients even remember things that happened 25 years ago, which was very different. And so if I can better understand that, that's like, okay, so we're, that's a different conversation. I can explain what it would be like now. I can explain what they could expect now and maybe they'll understand it's different. So that's an example of how understanding where they're coming from gives you a whole different place to start with them. You can also ask them, um, and this, this is one of those questions that takes a little bit of bravery. It's something that we're not used to asking, but to say, you know, sometimes we tell ourselves that the euthanasia will be easier tomorrow or next week or next month. Do you think that's how you're feeling right now? And I ask that question pretty often on the phone. Um, and a lot of times clients will say, yes, I, I think that. And yes, I realize that that's, you know, not true. And that's not how it is. And it helps to just name that. Um, and then another thing that we talk a lot about is quality of death. And I think we're very focused on talking about quality of life, which is very important. But for a lot of clients, it's helpful to talk about quality of death too. And, you know, asking them, like, what would you like his death to look like? And it, it sort of forces them to feel or to realize, you know, this is happening. And I have some element of control. 
and how do I want this to look? And it can look so many different ways. It can be at the clinic, it can be in their home, they can decide who to have there, when it happens. I mean, they have some choice in the matter, and I think sometimes they need to remember that they have that option. Um, and so I like to kind of, you know, switch from asking about quality of life to quality of death, and sometimes reminding them that, you know, we can wait, and that's a valid decision to make, but that just risks a different kind of death sometimes. So with um, kind of with a different kind of death comment, so we talk a lot about, you know, the options clients have. And I think this is important because it's not just let my pet suffer or euthanize my pet. There are many other options and, you know, shades of those options. So I like to go through and give clients all of those options. I, you know, let them know, of course, they can just wait and monitor their pet. If they do that, I usually tell them, you know, have an emergency plan in place and, I have this conversation with clients a lot on the phone, especially when I'm hearing, um, you know, signs in their pet that make me worry this could be an emergency situation. Um, and I'll say, you know, it's okay if you want to watch him and call us when you're ready. But if you do that, it would be good to have an emergency plan, know where you would drive, have the address, have the phone number, you know, who would help you get him into the car if it's in the middle of the night and kind of talking through those things. And I've actually found that often, even just explaining that emergency plan, helps them realize, oh, that's what could happen. You know, that's what could happen if I wait. I could, my 100 pound dog could collapse and I'm home alone and it's 2 a.m. You know, and of course we, we don't know if that could happen, but I think it's helpful for them to realize that that, that is a possibility and we could prevent it. Um, we also talk about natural death. And I think that's important because a lot of people think if I don't make this decision, you know, my pet will just pass away peacefully in their sleep. Um, and sometimes that happens, but we all know that a lot of times that doesn't happen. And so it's important to educate clients on what that could look like or what they could expect. It's not always what they see in the movies or what their parents told them happened when they were little kids to their pets. And so it's important to share the reality of that in a gentle and respectful way so that they know, you know, that could happen, but it could take longer than we, or it could look like this or that, depending on the pet's condition. And then of course, palliative and hospice care. So if clients aren't prepared to euthanize and they are worried about a natural death, offering any sort of palliative or hospice care option, um, pain medications, how much it would cost, what sort of follow-up is needed, explaining all of that is really helpful for clients. So some resources that we like to use, um, we use a lot of handouts and scales and articles. Um, and most of that is just because we, there's so much to cover and our phone calls um, are a little bit limited, you know, and it's hard to have those conversations sometimes when we're not in person. And most of the time, it's actually a conversation the family needs to have, you know, without us. And so we provide a lot of these resources. We, um, we like the journey scale a lot, and we have that on our website, and we also have an electronic form. So we encourage clients to fill that out, you know, even every day for a few days or for a few weeks to kind of track how their pet is doing and how their quality of life changes. Um, and we will email them various pain scales. And I especially like these, like the journey scale, for example, um, for families or couples who aren't on the same page. And I can't even tell you how many times I've had a call where I'm on speakerphone and it's like one partner and then the other partner and they don't agree or someone puts me on speakerphone and says, will you try to convince my husband? And so obviously we, that's a little beyond most of our expertise level. So I really like to encourage them to use those quality of life scales as a tool and as a conversation piece for them and to go through it as a family or to go through it as a couple. It's common for people to see different things. Um, be, depending on when they're home with their pet and that sort of thing. So we use a lot of those objective tools. So it's important to take care of yourself and your team to avoid compassion fatigue. We talked about that early on. So we're going to dig into that just a little bit more here. At your clinic or whatever sort of agency that you work, any sort of organization, um, it's important to create a moral climate. And you can have a very direct um, hand in this if you are a manager or a supervisor, but anyone on the team can help to create a moral climate. So a moral climate is a, just basically a, a space where people feel safe to discuss moral dilemmas and share support with each other. So being able to vent about their feelings, being able to uh, debrief difficult conversations, 
Um, it helps you have more positive feelings about euthanasia when you are able to debrief that, and then it helps you compassionately detach from your patient. And when we say compassionate detachment, which we say that all the time um, here at Minnesota Pets, especially this uh, challenging year that we've uh, all had due to COVID. So we, when you compassionately detach, it means that you allow other people to manage their own problems and be responsible for their own decisions while you support them on that journey without getting attached or being responsible for the outcome. And that's one of the reasons it's so important to give them all of the options, because when you lay that all out for them, it's sort of like you're giving it to them and you're, you're taking it off of yourself. They can choose. And of course, this takes practice. And this is easier said than done because we get so attached to our patients. Um, and so this, I don't want to to make this seem easier than it is, but it's definitely something that over time with practice, it does come a little bit more naturally. So to create a moral client, Climate at your clinic. Um, it's important to make time for debriefing um, and sharing case studies, sharing difficult conversations, talking about moral stress. It's good for that to happen organically, but if you have time, which I know this year, not many of you probably have a lot of extra time, but even just saying quickly, do you have a second? I have to tell you about this conversation I just had and making a five minute conversation even while you're doing something else is really important. Our team uses Slack, it's an instant messaging thing to um, like a system to stay up to date and communicate with each other. And we have a whole channel dedicated to debriefing. Our doctors debrief difficult visits that they had and it sort of allows you to get it off your chest and leave it there and people have an opportunity to provide some support and also to learn from it too. Um, don't be afraid to bring in outside support. If no one in your clinic feels equipped to have these conversations or, um, you know, to train each other, facilitate, bring in someone that does. There are many people out there. And if you message me, I'd be happy to um, connect you with those resources. And then encourage your coworkers to talk about their experiences and moral stress. If something happened and it's bothering them, that's a good thing to talk about. And not necessarily an inventing, you know, spiral of negativity sort of way, but in a get it off my chest, learn from it, get some support sort of way. So to debrief as a team, you can debrief these conversations by talking about what worked well, what didn't work, what you would do differently next time, what you wish would have happened. Breaking it down in that way is a way for it to be productive and a little less, um, you know, venting or kind of spiral of negativity. And then if you're debriefing on your own, if you're getting home from your clinic and you have a difficult conversation that is still weighing on you, it is very effective to debrief yourself um, and debrief by yourself, even just by writing down what happened. Um, studies have shown that this is helpful. It kind of moves that experience from the part of our brain that we can't do anything with. It just causes us you know, to feel more anxiety and it puts it in a part of our brain where we can process it and we can think about it and that decreases our stress. And so even just writing it down is, is helpful. So that is all I have. These are some of the references for um, the studies that informed what we talked about today. But if there's anything that came up that you'd like more, you know, a link or, or resources that aren't on this list, I'd be happy to provide that to you. All right. All right. <laughs> Big thank you to Dr. McComas, Christy, and Minnesota Pets for this extremely informative webinar. I hope everyone is able to identify tools that you can Im implement in your clinic right away. Um, on behalf of EHA, we're very excited for this collaboration series, and I hope to see everyone at our next session. Um, the next session will be titled, Walking Through a Client Present Euthanasia Before, During, and After. Um, this webinar will be Thursday, October 29th at 12 o'clock. I will include a link to the registration in the email I will send out this afternoon um, with the CE certificates. So if anybody has any questions, go ahead and use the chat box. I haven't had any questions come across yet. Sarah, maybe you can explain if someone on the team wasn't able to make it today, but they want to see, is this session recorded or will these be yes. recorded for them? Yep, we have recorded the session, um, so we'll upload it to YouTube, and then once we get the link, we'll have that on the website as well. Okay, cool, because they may be thinking of someone else on their team that just wasn't available today. Yep, very important. I love that Dawn, by the way, posted that shivering is another um, 
sign to watch for. And I'll add that to my list, shivering, absolutely. Even when it's not cold, <laughs> um, that's good. That's really good. All right, if that's everything, I think we'll end it. And thank you, ladies. That was a fantastic webinar. Thank you thank for you. having us, Sarah. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Have a good day, everybody.